I have to catch up on that um, after we uh, finish here. I want to talk today about drugs uh, because you can't talk about the colonies without talking about drugs. And I don't mean uh, drugs in the sort of illicit sense. I mean the things, basically a drug, the definition of a drug is something that crosses the blood brain barrier and uh, goes into and, aff and affects you directly. Uh, sorry, can you see that sugar? Uh, I'm, I'm cutting off my image there. So let me just move this down, move this up. When I initially designed these things, it was not, I did not have um, Twitch in mind. Okay, sugar, coffee, tobacco, cocoa, rum, the addictive drugs of the American uh, colonies. And sorry, I, I have not yet posted the Tuesday lecture on YouTube. I'll post them both uh, right after class today. Okay. Uh, also, uh, a couple people asked if I would uh, post a sample question, and I just did that on Packback. Um, one thing, uh, too, about Packback that um, the grad students mentioned, uh, we've had a little bit of confusion. If, if for the week, um, the earliest you should post is Sunday morning uh, for that week, and the latest you can post is Saturday evening, there's a little bit of confusion because sometimes somebody will post, make a post on Saturday evening for the following week, and it's confusing. We don't know whether to give you credit for that, the current week or the previous week or something like that. So in general, for the pack pack postings, if you post on uh, as early as Sunday um, and your two answers as late as Saturday, um, it'll, you'll still get credit for it. Uh, in general, I'd like Tuesday postings and Thursday responses. But if you post early, don't post too early. Don't post the Saturday before class because then we get uh, a little bit confused or I get confused. The TAs get confused about um, which uh, pack back a week to give you credit for. Does that make sense? Okay. And a few of you have noticed that uh, your, your pack back grade, it says dropped. <laughs> and that's because we dropped the two lowest grades. And since you've only got two grades, um, those are both, by definition, the two highest grades and the two lowest grades. Um, you means which chapter? Uh, so, uh, yes, we will do, uh, uh, let me see, I think that's right. We, uh, let me t take a look at the syllabus, that's a great question. Five, the 16th is the first exam. That's a Tuesday. No, so there's uh, there's no pack back posting on the on the week of the first exam because there's no chapter the week of the first exam. Um, so chapter five we're doing on uh, next week, and then the following week we're going to have the exam. But there's no there's no posting due for Thursday. Does that make sense? Yeah, the exam is Tuesday, February 16th. That, that's when I'll post it at 11.10. Okay. All right. But in each case for the week, let me just make sure that that's true. Um, there's, yeah, in each case for the week that we have the exam, there is no pack back posting. Uh, again, a rubric. Um, so let me just sort of lay out what I'm looking for. Uh, um, uh, rubric is, is not a term that we use in, in the, um, it's, it's more of a, a term that's used in high school than used in college, but um, rubric, what we're looking for is an organized answer to the question. It should have an introduction. It should have a conclusion. It's about 300 words. Um, the the pack back postings that you've already made are actually in a way, um, particularly the answers to questions are in a way a kind of sample run, a dry run of a short version of that answer. So what we're looking for is an organized answer that's sort of persuasive. Um, we will have class on that week. I'll still be lecturing, but there just won't be a reading that we'll be commenting on for Packback, if that makes sense. Okay. Other questions about the class? All right. And is it true I've got 130, 130 folks here? Or is it... Oh, the, the answer should be about um, 217. Okay, good. Um, the answer should be about 300 words, uh, give or take. So that's basically 
uh, a page uh, type typed um, and a little over, thanks, a little over uh, a page. So a page is generally about 250 words. Um, so, it, you know, Times Roman 11 point or something like that, it'd be around a page. So it's that's the answer to the question. Uh, and again, I ask you to take around an hour to do it. Um, that's uh, 218. Okay, good. All right. Just want to make sure I wasn't uh, I'm, oh, there we are. And then the, now the Twitch stats are updated. Okay. Okay. Other questions about stuff? I posted a sample question. That might be a good one. Uh, single space, double space, doesn't matter. Um, you can post it as a Word file. You can edit as a Word file and post it. Um, you can also post it as... Uh, um, yeah, that, uh, upload it as a, as a Word document or something like that. One thing to uh, don't, if you have a Mac and you've got that old Mac software that is its own um, uh, piece of software, don't save it in that because I, we can't read those files. Uh, you want to uh, ideally uh, do this in Word or something like that. Uh, uh, the, the link for the YouTube videos is on um, the syllabus. Did not use pages. I'm going to open. I'm going to post the question at eleven ten uh, next week, and at the beginning of class time, basically, and you'll have until uh, basically eleven of the next day. Pages is the program I'm talking about. Yeah, please don't do it in pages. Uh, we can't read pages for whatever reason. When you convert something from pages, Microsoft from uh, Windows pages to to Word. Uh, it doesn't, it, like, we get a whole bunch of black boxes and things like that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Tiny URL slash Stinky Scott. Okay. And again, it's 1130, 1110 on Tuesday the 16th. I'll post it. And this is ELC. Oh, um, you're right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the 16th. I have trouble with days and dates and weeks and months, things like that. Okay. But the first exam is on the 16th, indeed, on Tuesday. Yeah, PDF is okay. Oh, that's that's a good point, uh, Louise, thank you. Um, if you're using pages, you can save it as PDF and, and that should probably work. Uh, all the PowerPoints for previous classes are posted on ELC. Somebody asked earlier if I could post the old, uh, if my, my PowerPoints, but I will um, update those as we go along. Um, but I'll do that, uh, I'll also do that today. Uh, make sure that they're up to date. But right now, there are PowerPoints for this entire class, um, the, the time that I taught it last, which is last year. Uh, so so there are PowerPoints that are available. They look a little bit different than the PowerPoints I'm using now because I edit them every time. Okay. All right. Sugar, coffee, tobacco, cocoa, rum, the addictive drugs of the American colonies. Okay. We talked before about sugar. And sugar is very old, goes back to um, something developed in the centuries earlier in Persia, which is now Iran. It started in Polynesia, but Persians figured out how to boil it down <laughs> and transport it. Uh, there was a saying in the Middle East that sugar follows the Koran. It was adopted by Muslim traders, the Abayids and the Abbasids. Uh, I should spell that. I'm going to misspell Abbasids. No, I think I did spell it right. The Abbasids and the Abbasids. Um, and then by the Ottoman Turks. They uh, had used an enslaved labor force as early as 950 AD. And um, that enslaved labor force came from, uh, it came from this Slavic area in Northern Europe. Uh, this area here, and that's where we get the term Slav. Uh, and it also came, some of them came from uh, East Africa and things like that. But these enslaved people worked on these islands like Crete and Cyprus and Sicily uh, going from the 13th to the 16th century. Yeah, Persians boiled sugar. So, so it initially comes, it's, it's actually off the map. It comes from Polynesia, but the Persians figure out how to take sugar cane and boil it down uh, in, uh, to make sugar. We know that uh, basically from uh, documents written around this period, the 12th century, they say that uh, it's the Persians that first come up with this. When the Portuguese and Spanish find the new world, they quickly set up plantations in America that are factories in the field. And they use kind of the latest technology of the 1600s 
Um, as we said last class, there was an Islamic slave trade, right? There was an Islamic slave trade that made uh, mostly in uh, women going from west to east uh, that precedes the Americans, uh, the European slave trade. But the Europeans weaponize it and what, and what I call war capitalism, and Sven Beckert calls war capitalism, using coastal forts and proxy warriors who destroy communities looking for slaves. So rather than taking a few captives and bringing them over, um, what we see is just the wiping out of, of whole communities of people uh, searching for slaves. And these people are brought over to produce, at first, sugar. Now, sugar plantations flourish in this period, going from 1600 down. This is the price of sugar, right? In uh, real prices, uh, pence per pound. Um, which, <laughs> I don't know why it's in pence per pound, but it's a British, uh, I guess it's the, this is British sugar prices. All right, so real sugar prices are super expensive. In 1600, uh, sugar was um, into a dowry. Oh, that's a great question, Will. Um, why is it that the that the Portuguese basically hung out on the small forts? Basically, they, they they couldn't they couldn't conquer these regions. Really, they couldn't dominate um, these regions. It was dangerous. There's some there's some ecological explanations too. The tsetse fly, um, very briefly, the tsetse fly is uh, a fly that that uh, dominates in this area in in southern Africa. Let me see. Let me. Okay. Yeah, so this is the area of the tsetse fly here and east. In this whole area, you can't have horses or donkeys or anything like that to carry things. And most carrying is taken place by individuals. So um, the short answer is that the Portuguese basically can't penetrate into this region because of the tsetse fly, because the tsetse fly carries these diseases that wipe out animals. So that's, a, that's an important explanation for... Um, how this how this happens uh, that's a good question I know, yeah i know it's from the previous class okay so this is sugar prices um if you were from a wealthy family and um royalty or connected to royalty um and you had a dowry that was to be given to a husband right that dowry some of that dowry would be sugar right that's how valuable sugar was uh, I just imagine just a couple of pounds of brown sugar being, uh, you know, the family wealth. But uh, that was how valuable sugar was. It was incredibly valuable. It was a preservative. Um, it was a flavoring, uh, things like that. Um, and so it goes from this insane price of 30 pence per pound down to, by 1700, something like 10 pence. So it's a, basically the price is cut into one third of its previous price. Uh, by 1700 and look at this this is the sugar consumption and what we see is consumption pounds per capita just skyrockets from 1600 to 1850. so where's that sugar going um the this is the, uh so so this uh, da, 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 da. this is an oxford coffee shop so where's the sugar going uh bear with me here for a second i've got an image here someplace there we go this is White's Chocolate House in St. James, London, around the time of Queen Anne in 1708. And this is one of the places that, sh that sugar is going. It's, it's going to um, combine with chocolate uh, to be produced into a chocolate drink that is consumed by royalty. Okay? Uh, <laughs> you get a sense of the image here. This is around 1708. And these are the people that can afford sugar, right? Is uh, people who can afford sugar mixed with chocolate in uh, uh, coffee houses, this sugar is just is just very very valuable. Uh, okay, now before I start talking about coffee, yeah, okay. So that's that sugar. Sugar plantations flourish and the price has dropped. It quickly becomes a sweetener for other drugs uh, from Asia like tea. So people would drink uh, tea, which goes all the way back to the I don't know sixth century or something like that in China. Uh, more and more uh, British. Folks drink tea in the 16th and 17th century as the British Empire expands, and that tea is flavored with uh, sugar. Um, the Portuguese and the Spanish, they quickly set up plantations that are factories in the field. Um, the sugar plantations flourish. As part of the ideology of mercantilism, that is the control of colonies, Europeans wanted to produce goods that they would otherwise have to buy from elsewhere. And I'm going to talk about a little bit more about mercantilism later. Um, 
or sometimes called mercantilism, Europeans wanted to produce goods that they would otherwise have to buy from elsewhere. Coffee is an excellent example of this because coffee is a good that comes over from traders in the Middle East. The Ottoman Turks have a monopoly on coffee until about 1700. Okay. The first coffee shop appeared in Oxford in 1650. It was seen as a medicine, something that sharpened your wits, drove away sleep, and restrained lust, believe it or not. Okay, so people th saw it as a kind of, uh, re recognized that it was a sort of a drug, it was treated as a drug, but uh, almost like a medicine. And uh, you paid quite a bit for it. This was the coffee vendor. Uh, it would go to um, these, uh, again, uh, people with powdered wigs, the, the upper class, the upper, upper class. Uh, we now know that coffee is concentrated caffeine, which was also in tea, uh, a substance that was produced in China and used for thousands of years. Um, because most Europeans were familiar with tea, having been used it since the sixth or seventh century, uh, coffee looked like a like a drug that was that was similar. It it seemed to be more uh, stronger. It became associated with business transactions, contracts, and trade deals. Right. So the coffee shop was the sort of um, the sort of Wall Street of the 17th century. That was where business was transacted, was in a coffee shop. You went to a coffee shop, you drank coffee because you believed that it sharpened your wits and uh, made you make better deals. Um, you went to a coffee shop because the coffee shop was a place where newspapers were circulated. If you look here at this image, um, people have papers there. This is often where newspapers went. They didn't go to individual houses. They went to the coffee shops in the 1600s and there would be uh, some parts of the, the, these would be posted on what was called a bulletin board, which is a bulletin of uh, announcements and things like that. And they would also be circulated and sitting around for people to read at coffee shops. They would be signing contracts here, uh, making trade deals, buying stock and things like that. So coffee is um, an important part of deal making in this period. And it, again, it's, it's something that's consumed by the elite. Poor people didn't drink coffee. The coffee was a rich pe person's drink. Okay, so mocha. It is, in 1700, it's an Ottoman uh, monopoly. And this is a serious problem. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. So that was 1650. I want to show you uh, a Vien the first coffee shop that's established in Vienna in 1683. So about 30 years later. And this is the, this is the image that people had of coffee, right? You've got the Turkish coffee dealer here. Uh, you've got um, the sort of swashbucklers. Coffee, again, was associated with, with discussion and deal making. There's also something sort of somewhat illicit about coffee making, as you can see here, um, that the people believe that coffee um, uh, could restrain lust, but but that it was also um, you know associated with uh, people being too close together, making deals. Uh, it was a space for mostly men, but um, but as you can see here, in the 1680s, men and women uh, increasingly. Okay. So both sugar and coffee were tropical drugs, initially manufactured and controlled by the Arab and then Turkish traders. And uh, most of the coffee came from the uh, port of Mocha, which is now in Yemen. <laughs> right? It's creeping me out. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. That is quite a look, right? Yeah, he is not thrilled with the portrait painter there. Um, it must have taken quite a while to, to uh, draw this. I'm drinking my coffee here, so. Uh... So both sugar and coffee were tropical drugs, initially manufactured and controlled by the Arab and then Turkish traders, mostly coming from the port of Mocha, which is now Yemen. European colonists make use of the land in the Americas to transplant these preservatives and drugs. Okay, so this is where it comes from, Yemen. The issue is to steal that coffee tech. Right? There's, there's some technology about this coffee, how it's grown, how it's roasted, how it's transported, how it's ground up to make coffee. Both sugar and, um, so European colonists, between 1690 and 1720, Europeans would steal coffee plants. They actually sent spies into Yemen. <laughs> I don't know who Peter Pettigrew is. Uh, they would steal coffee plants that's, and then set up massive greenhouses in Europe to preserve them. This is part one of war capitalism. Part one of war capitalism is if somebody else makes something that you want, the first thing you do is freaking steal it, right? And so 
That's what universities are about, right? That's an important part of what universities do. Remember when I talked about the Dutch that set up the University of Leiden in 1675? It was in the middle of their war with the Holy Roman Empire. I talked about the Hanseatic advantage, you know, the colleges were about educating accountants and bookkeepers. Colleges are also, universities are also about stealing commodities from around the world. European universities were all about stealing commodities. Um, in the center of Leiden University is a greenhouse. The greenhouse was the place where tropical commodities were transported from 1675 uh, until uh, 1720. Anything that was tropical, you would send spies over. They would p uh, pick up the original plants, they would transplant them, and then try to grow them in a kind of hothouse environment, basically a greenhouse environment, to see um, what, what produced uh, good tasting coffee and stuff like that. Right, British museums likewise, uh, all that glass. Um, so colleges were about stealing commodities. The imperial powerhouse of the Netherlands grew out of coffee tech from its gardens after about 1690. And so as these, the red dot is Yemen. These uh, gold stars are places that I identified as royal greenhouses where science of botany and biology get their start. This is where we get, um, Oh, who's uh, Linnaeus, right? Linnaeus, who divides the world up into genus and species and things like that. If um, When I took biology, people thought that there was such a thing as genus and species. Increasingly, biologists say, this is, you know, your, your, um, this, this medieval, the 17th century method of dividing things up is, is, uh, doesn't actually make a lot of sense. But Linnaeus and uh, many of the other people who followed him trying to create kingdoms and phylums and subphylums of plants and animals so that they can, and the, the big takeaway is how to steal these medicinal products from the East, uh, these valuable products from the East. They were transported as plants across the Atlantic. And this is part two, all right? So part one is steal that coffee tech. Part two, and sugar tech. Part two is transplanting them. And so they discover that you need to be places near the equator to grow this stuff, coffee and sugar. And so you transplant that coffee using enslaved workers to grow it, okay? So the 17th century coffee plantations are transplantations. Uh, sorry. Can you see that? <sighs> Okay, let me try this again. 17th century coffee translations are transplantations. So we have Martinique over here on the left, which is French. We have um, uh, Brazil, which is Portuguese. We have Suriname over here, which is Dutch. And we have Java, which is over here, which is also Dutch. So that's the Netherlands. Um, you know, the, the Dutch and the Netherlands are the same thing, but, uh, more or less. Um, we, we say Holland is a smaller part of the Netherlands, but the Dutch, Holland, the Netherlands, those are the, the same, the th this, they're all three the same thing. Um, uh, the, the, you transplant that coffee using coffee tech and then use enslaved workers to do it. And you gather those enslaved workers from along the Gulf of Guinea here, um, well, from Senegambia all the way down to uh, Angola, and transplant them to grow coffee in these distant plantations. Okay, I found this image, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, part two of war capitalism is transplant. So basically you transplant these goods and so you can, um, uh, oh, sorry. I keep saying names. That's Suriname. And it's a place in, uh, if we look on a map, it's Suriname is over here. Uh, and this is, oh, I guess it's spelled uh, there's an E at the end. There wasn't an E at the end in the 18th century, but there's an E at the end now. Uh, but that's Suriname, and it's basically northeast, um, uh, northeastern part of South America. Okay. Now think about this. Think about this transplantation business. You're not just transplanting the plants. You're transplanting people, right? People that you've stolen from the African continent. Uh, the definition of transplantation, uh, basically to take something and plant it again. You know, that's the term plantation is it, it, in, in part a planting of people, right? So, and transplantation is basically where you take, um, literally where you take something that's planted in one th uh, place, like mocha that's, uh, coffee that's planted in mocha and you transplant it 
first to Europe and then figure out what, what latitude you need to produce it on. And then you transplant it to the new world. And then you have other people do this work for you. Now, this is, these are coffee plantation workers. Uh, now, this is around 1870, but slavery is still exists in Brazil. And if you look at the women here, you'll notice something, that they're dressed in what's more or less... <laughs> right? <laughs> what's more or less... Um, Ebo and Yoruba costumes, right? Ebo and Yoruba. So um, let me spell that out. So Ebo and Yoruba communities, which are now in, not Angola, are now in, oh my goodness, this is embarrassing. Nigeria. Um, Ebo and Yoruba peoples who were in Nigeria wore hats like this. They had, um, if you look up Yoruba headdress or Igbo headdress, you'll see this. Um, they carried uh, stuff on their heads. Um, the men wear these kind of longer uh, shirts and, and th uh, things like that, but it's more visible with the women, that bees are basically transplanted Africans who are producing goods. Oh, you're Igbo, awesome. <laughs> Nigeria, yeah, sorry, embarrassing. Uh, 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 so, so, um, anyways, so yeah, so Ibo and Yoruba, uh, tradition. And so these are dressed, they're people in Ibo and Yoruba dress, right? But, um, oh, right. Okay. Excellent. So, so this is Ibo and Yoruba dress and it's transplanted into these uh, colonies as these, uh, you have these sort of transplanted Africans, uh, that are producing these goods. Okay. They were transported as plants across the Atlantic. By 1700, French have coffee in Martinique. The Portuguese have coffee in Brazil. The Dutch have coffee in, oh, a friend of this year, but, uh, in Java. Uh, it's funny, um, I, I was in uh, Toronto and I heard someone speaking Yoruba. I took a, a African history as a, as a minor and uh, I, I heard her talking on the phone and, and uh, I leaned over and I said, are you speaking Yoruba? And uh, she uh, kind of, uh, I don't think she expected someone in Toronto to be able to uh, understand um, uh, Yoruba. I don't understand it, but I knew I when I heard it, I knew uh, what it was. So coffee in Britain and Europe is starts out as an upper class drink, while most poor people in Britain get their caffeine from tea. Crucial though is that all of these goods start as elite goods, and then their supply increases from the colonies, which addicts people to buy more and more. Consumption spreads and sends more and more gold across the Atlantic to chase these highs, right? So people are investing more and more in these goods because the value of these things um, is unstoppable. Let me just let me just show you this, all right? So this is the price is dropping, but consumption is skyrocketing, right? From 1700 to 1850, this is coffee. Consumption is skyrocketing from 1600 to 1850. This is sugar more and more people are drinking uh, this, uh, these goods, more and more people are consuming them. The third drug that's important is tobacco. Uh, this is a tobacco shop in the Netherlands in 1680, and it too is, uh, you know, just, um, th this, these goods are very valuable. I wanna talk a little bit about the chemistry uh, of this um, because I what, am a science nerd and I wanna talk a little bit about chemistry. Uh, but let but let's first of all consider how complicated this war capitalism is. Dutch, English, and Portuguese people steal coffee beans from Yemen. They plant transplant them to universities and royal gardens in the 1650s. Then they pay other groups to steal people from Africa, transport them on ships to the New World, force them to grow coffee, dry the beans, transport the beans back to Europe, right? to go in European coffee cups, right? That is a massive global supply chain that's being created in part by destroying other communities uh, around the world. That's war capitalism, right? Is this transplantation and then the creation of these massive, very long supply chains that spread all over, in, in fact, go literally across the ocean multiple times. Okay, so they break up settled communities like the Tuscaroras in uh, North America or like the Igbo and the Yoruba people from what is now uh, Nigeria. Okay, tobacco is a North American product. Tobacco, while well, the other goods have to grow in the tropics, tobacco can grow a little bit further north. So 
these tropical commodities have to be pretty close to the equator. And this is uh, more where the coffee is grown. So you see the equator here. Coffee has to grow in this nar uh, narrow band uh, down here. But, toba but tobacco can grow further north, uh, including in the Chesapeake. Okay. It's widely used, along with a hundred other medicinal herbs by Native Americans, but tobacco is by far the most addictive. Nicotine is the active agent. It's a poison that's excreted by tobacco plants. Uh, nicotine is excreted by tobacco plants to prevent insects from eating them. So this is a kind of natural defense that's millions of years old, nicotine is, um, produced by uh, tobacco plants that prevents insects from eating them. It's, it's that sour taste from tobacco is what uh, prevents. And, and it's what's in nicotine is a neurological toxin that enters bugs' bloodstreams. And it's so tiny that, <laughs> that it crosses into their brains and causes paralysis and death, okay? So that's why initially tobacco plants developed this, nicotine, is it, it's a substance that crosses. So most things that you eat and digest don't go into your brain, but very, very tiny things can. Very, very tiny molecules can. Not the big ones, but the tiny molecules can. And one of those tiny molecules is nicotine. And nicotine crosses into the blood-brain barrier of a bug, enters it bra its brain, and causes paralysis and death. Nicotine, in fact, is so in fact, if effective at killing bugs that a whole strain of insecticides were created in the 1990s uh, that emulated them, called neonicotinoids. -nic neonicotinoids, um, also called neonics. It's now believed that these neonics are what caused, or what, what killed honeybees around the world uh, in the 2000s and up to the present. Um, that basically people took this, uh, this nicotine, added it to other plants, uh, put it in uh, uh, other plants genetically, and uh, this is what has killed honeybees around the world. Okay. In humans, the absorption of nicotine does something slightly different. <laughs> it doesn't paralyze us or cause death. It hijacks our dopamine receptors. Now, dopamine is the internal way of giving pleasure for things that benefit your body. So dopamine is, is transmitted um, uh, on, on this, this side and it's received on this side. Um, when we eat or drink or exercise or make friends or have sex, our body produces dopamine that gives the brain a reward. Our prefrontal cortex, uh, that sort of concrete learning part of our brain, basically records that action and reminds us to do it again. It's a little bit like a program where if I eat again, I'll be happy. Man, that was good. You, the flood of, um, of um, dopamines that, that goes to the receptors and basically records that action. You think, oh, I'll do this again. I'll have sex again. I'll drink. Uh, I'll, I'll um, uh, exercise again. I'll eat again. Uh, it's hard to say, uh, tobacco is initially, uh, we, before time, uh, I want to say six or seven or 800, it's, it's used by Native Americans, uh, but it's around 1680 or 1690 that Europeans finally figure out how to hijack it and produce it in a way that um, uh, has a more pleasing taste. Um, the stomach reduces peptides that eventually tell us that we're full and, then th and that euphoria goes away. What nicotine does is it invades the bloodstream, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and hammers away at the reward system. So this is the dopamine receptor here on the right. And what nicotine does is it locks itself in to the dopamine receptor and hammers it. It's like, oh, aren't you happy? Oh, aren't you happy? Oh, aren't you happy? Oh, go over and over again. It stimulates the, the nervous system in the ACH receptor. It causes your pulse to go up, and it causes a kind of rush. For Europeans who try tobacco, it resembles coffee, both the rush and the resemblance to caffeine. Tobacco was used as a cure, again, it was, it was a medicine for a uh, liquid in the lungs. They thought it somehow dried out the lungs, but of course it becomes much more addictive and people go back again and again to it. Just like with sugar and coffee, to, and, and so coffee, sugar, and tobacco, all three of them hammer away at the pleasure portions of your brain, basically this, uh, the dopamine receptors, and 
they're sort of artificial stimulants that do this, that kind of lock themselves into the receptors and provide you that service, that joy again and again and again. Um, and this is why sugar, we, we eat sugar because it's sweet, but sugar also activates dopamine. Uh, it's also an appetite suppressant, all three of them, because the ordinary method that the body signals the brain is to get food, um, with, and that feeds the dopamine system, and that's blocked, right? So that's why people who diet will drink a lot of coffee. They, they used to smoke cigarettes to diet. Um, uh, yeah, tea also has uh, caffeine in it, but it's not as strong as there is in coffee. The thing about coffee is that it's much more concentrated caffeine uh, than tea. Okay. All these goods. So how does this spread? How does this the market expand into Europe? I mean, it's an addictive drug for one thing, but it expands because of soldiers. All three of these goods, tobacco, sugar, and coffee, appear to be transplanted by soldiers and sailors. Uh, unlike peasants, uh, soldiers are basically poor people, right? Uh, formerly peasants, but and they've taken the king's shilling uh, is the expression where they basically are, uh, <laughs> this is a press gang where uh, somebody is, um, th th these, a press gang is somebody who, who grabs you, uh, they'll often get you drunk in a tavern, um, they'll drag you, they'll force you to take the king's shilling and then suddenly you're in the Navy. And this, this is basically how Britain gets its Navy is the press gang. The press gang pulls people into the Navy in this way, you take the king's shilling and then you're on the hook for three or five or 10, in, in Russia it's 20 years, uh, in these, in the Navy, um, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, if you took the ASVAB test, I took the ASVAB, I mentioned this before you, uh, right? If you took the ASVAB test, those people are calling you every day, uh, telling you that you could be working in military intelligence or whatever. Uh, these people are a little rougher than that. They're whacking you over the head. They're putting you on a ship. When you wake up, uh, you are now a sailor. Um, okay. These people, Army and Navy soldiers who are kind of pressed into service, uh, you're also pressed, the press gangs are also how people are brought into the Army. Um, they hung outside of pubs. They suddenly have spendable cash or, and they're incredibly bored most of the time. You've heard the line that combat is months of boredom punctuated by moments of pure terror. This makes being a common soldier or sailor a kind of easy candidate for psychoactive drugs. These are the people who, they have a little money, um, they're the ones who start early on to use these drugs. Okay, this this is the same image, uh, and this is tobacco prices. Uh, tobacco prices start at, in pennies per sterling at 27, and then that sh shoots down uh, after 17, uh, 16, 20. Oh, I said 16, 70, but it's actually it's actually earlier than that. I apologize. Tobacco um, is is cultivated in in the Caribbean earlier than this. Oh, sorry, you can't see my image. Okay, and again, the price is dropping, um, but the volume is increasing. And so this is tobacco imports into England, which is a little bit slightly different time period, but you can see that the number of imports is uh, increasing from around uh, 30,000 to around 50,000 between 1700 and 1775. Okay. So as soldiers, sorry, let me just talk about soldiers here for a second. Uh, around the move around in wars all over Europe in the 17th century, we see coffee, tobacco, and sugar consumption go up after they leave. So a lot of places in Europe that had not consumed coffee, tobacco, and sugar are consuming them uh, after basically European uh, wars. People become familiarized with these international goods that are initially designed uh, for elites. But uh, rapidly, be because of their drug-like qualities, become consumed by more and more people. Now, cocoa is... What does a shilling have to do with tobacco? Uh, uh, so this is taking the king's shilling, and this is, the, um, this is basically soldiers and sailors, and these are the people who are, um, <clears throat> who are uh, uh, consuming tobacco, coffee, and sugar. And, and, and this, is, this was often said about sailors and soldiers, uh, old sailors and soldiers, was that they consumed all these goods, uh, coffee, tobacco, and sugar. Now, a fourth drug is cocoa. Now, cocoa is like tobacco in that it's a North American export uh, or an American export from the Americas. 
when Cortez captured Montezuma, right? And we talked about that. He goes to the uh, around, um, he takes over Mexica about 1521. He goes, the first place he goes to is the Aztec treasure vault, right? He expects that it's going to be filled with gold because he knows that Tenochtitlan, uh, in Tenochtitlan, the um, Aztec um, um, leaders uh, drink cocoa out of gold cups and they throw out the gold cup every time they use it. What he discovers is not gold, but tens of thousands of cocoa beans, all dried, which acted as a currency in Aztec society. Montezuma drank from a gold cup and then gave the cup away after he was finished. He drank it every day. And this is the image of conspicuous consumption. He showed off kind of his power by drinking co coffee. And so cocoa, not coffee, cocoa, cocoa was this image of conspicuous consumption and people drank cocoa. And cocoa also has these drug-like qualities. Um, when people drank cocoa in the Aztec society, they drank it as a liquid. It was hot. It didn't have any sugar in it. It was pretty bitter. It's like, imagine drinking uh, dark chocolate, you know, a drink that's basically with dark chocolate, but with no sugar in it. It was very, very sour. Um, when it's transported to the New World, it's mixed with sugar, which is another tropical commodity. And the two are combined together to get the kind of candy drink, uh, initially cocoa drink, and then eventually the candy bar. In Europe, it quickly becomes associated with the highest level of the aristocracy. The very wealthiest people meet in, uh, whereas sh um, people who were merchants and in the kind of middle class or the upper middle class went to coffee shops. Very rich people went to chocolate houses. Um, oh, that was Montezuma that would throw out his gold cups. He would get a gold cup every every t time, and he would throw it out, and someone would grab the cup, and this was a sort of um, to demonstrate. So demonstrate his his wealth. He had there was a great deal of gold in uh, the New World, but um, for them, for the people, the Aztecs, the gold was not the most valuable thing. The most valuable thing was the cocoa. <laughs> okay, where's cocoa from? Cocoa comes from Mexico, uh, what we now call Mexico, and it's it's an Aztec drink. Uh, that's a medicinal drink initially, uh, but also a kind of uh, a, a drink that other people um, that, that was also drunk because it was again because it was a drug. In Europe, it becomes associated with the highest level of the aristocracy. No one you couldn't go into a coffee uh, chocolate shop unless you were incredibly wealthy, uh, and very likely you had to know someone to get into one of these things. Now let's talk a little bit about caffeine. Caffeine breaks down in your body uh, into three things. <laughs> and you know this is not on the exam but I just it's important to kind of understand basically the chemistry of these things all of these things are things that are tiny uh, molecules that cross into the blood brain barrier caffeine is too big it breaks down before it crosses into the brain into um, these three things paraxanthine theobromine and theophylline um, uh, we in fact many drugs that we have have these three things in them so poor people, um, no, uh, basically middle class people drink coffee, rich people drink cocoa, uh, poor people drink tea. Uh, was the, was, was, I guess the symbol, in Britain anyways, so that's, that's the way it works. Okay, it contains theobromine, which is one of the things that the body produces when it breaks down caffeine. Theobromine increases the flow of oxygen to the brain. It appears to trigger some of the reactions in the brain that come with having sex. Uh, sometimes it's viewed as an aphrodisiac and other times as a replacement for sex. And this is why coffee was viewed. It, it had that feeling of, of sort of post-sex feeling uh, that, that um, we, we associate with theobromine. Theobromine itself is a poison for dogs and cats because we process theobromine fairly quickly, but don't ever give um, either co coffee or chocolate to uh, dogs because um, the, the, the caffeine is, is basically will kill them. They can't process the theobromine and their, their, their bodies will, will break it down. You, you have to go to the emergency room if your animal drinks, um, uh, either gets a coffee or chocolate. Okay. Uh, now, you know, a sip of coffee is fine, but, but a, lo a lot of it is, is a problem. And so the, the effects then, all of them are, uh, caffeine produces heightened brain activity and the things it breaks down into the flow, increase the flow of oxygen, increase heart rate, increase athletic performance. All of these things are now drugs that we use separately uh, as drugs.
Okay, so it's these drugs that are concentrated and delivered over long. <laughs> oh, is that right? Okay, yeah. Uh, the, um, the production of sugar. The boiling down of cane sugar produces two products. The dried and granulated sugar that you're used to, although it's mostly brown sugar that's produced in this period. White sugar is a 19, is an invention really of the 1850s. When people talk about sugar, they're talking really about brown sugar. The leftover black stuff in the production, so you take the sugar, uh, the, the, the you take the cane, you crush it, you take the pulpy mass, and then you boil it. And when you boil it down, 100 pounds of sugar cane gives you only 10 pounds of crystalline sugar, and, and more than that, something like 30 pounds of blackstrap molasses, which is a waste product, basically, initially. That was a waste product in Persia. It was a waste product in, uh, in, um, in the Middle East. It's sweet, but it has all the impurity, other impurities in it. And so we, can use, we use molasses because it has an interesting flavor. We sometimes use it in cookies and things like that. Um, but using a Muslim technique of distilling, first it's used in Spain and stolen from Arab texts um, for medicine, around 1300, Europeans start to slowly heat European beer and wine using this uh, Muslim method. And they draw off steam, uh, the, the steam that's created by boiling uh, beer and wine uh, or, sh or, uh, or, sh or sugar. And, they, and um, they take the stuff that's boiled below 100 degrees. While beer and wine has only about 10% alcohol, by taking away the steam from beer or wine, you could make 30% alcoholic drinks. Drinks that could actually catch on fire. The technology quickly spreads throughout Europe after 1300 um, with the dis discovery of the printing press. It came to be called burnt wine, or in German, brunt wine, and in English, brandy wine, or simply brandy. Beer was turned into whiskey in the same process. So basically what you're doing is the first part of the production of sugar is producing this, um, is, is the boiling. The second production of sugar, if you boil it again for a second time, you can produce alcohol, just like you could with beer or wine. Fortified beer or wine is, is really important because it allows basically the Americans to enter into the slave trade. It was more concentrated than African mead or palm wines. Basically, Africans are producing beer and wine themselves. Um, and this basically what we're going to call rum is eventually going to call, be called rum is used as a product um, both for local um, vendors and for for uh, and it becomes a, a a more serious drug. So basically, you're concentrating this drug even more seriously. Okay, it's a great point. I'll, I'll talk about why it's important in a second, uh, but let me just uh, so you you have a the the first uh, uh, removal into the spirit safe, and then you you uh, uh, heat it again and again take take out the steam and produce that in a second uh, draft, and that's what produces alcohol. Okay, so this produces rum. Okay, rum is basically the leftovers from the sugar process. You get the brown sugar, which you sell for a very high price, but you have all this leftover molasses. The leftover molasses, um, with use, beginning with experiments in the 1630s, they try to further refine this basically leftover product, the useless molasses, using a distiller. They already have products for boiling sugar, and so they basically use it to run the sugar, the molasses, again and again and again through this distiller multiple times, and they produce this bitter drink called Kill Devil. Kill Devil. It was initially just sold to locals for a cheap price. And it's what it is, is basically molasses turned into high alcohol, um, stuff with high alcohol. Um, by 1650, they renamed it to rum bullion, an English word for riot. Rum bullion is, a, is an English word for a riot. And people called it rum for short. Rum was given to slaves and slave people as part of the seasoning process to weed out weak people. So rum was given to enslaved people to, um, it would basically kill people who were weaker 
Um, it was also used in an, as an inducement to do extra works or to do unpleasant tasks. Right. <laughs> the, the important transformation of rum is that ultimately it's adopted by the Navy. The Navy had previously given, uh, uh, you know, ale and things like that to uh, the s sailors, but it became so popular that it, or, and mostly beer was given to every sailor. Uh, it's replaced by rum in the 1680s. And it comes from this guy, Edward Vernon, who's uh, was called Old Grogram because of this Grogram coat, which is made of silk and wool. And he, he comes up with the idea of producing this thing called grog, which is a mixture of water, rum, sugar, and either limes or lemons. And it was named after him. Grog was named after him. Uh, so this is where we get grog from. This is where we get rum from. So these concentrated calories do the sort of same, have similar effects, the alcoholic effects. They, um, uh, I don't have the, what the brain does, but, but basically the, um, uh, that narcotic effect and that ex excitement effect. Uh, right? that's, a, that's a mojito. Uh, this is where um, basically it becomes uh, widely distributed. So, um, so this colonial product of molasses, which is basically a leftover process from the sugar process, becomes this incredibly valuable product. Rum, once it's discovered that this can be used uh, to replace alcohol and others. And it's much more portable, right? So you take this rum barrel and you can, a rum, a beer barrel will feed, uh, well, can be given to, uh, let's say, um, 100 cups can feed a Navy for, um, can be fed to a Navy for, let's say, uh, a week. Um, a barrel of rum can feed, can be fed to a Navy for over a month, right? Because it's so much more concentrated. Uh, right, that's why there's a Bacardi factory in Puerto Rico. That's why if you look at rum, it's, a, it's always has plantation rum or something like that. Liquor was so strong that a half pint though made the men useless. Okay, <laughs> surely not a month. In any event, the rum was lasted longer. It, you needed fewer rum barrels. Um, okay, the most important thing about rum was that it solidified the trade between the new world uh, and the old. Sugar went from the Caribbean to New England where it would became rum. Uh, so initially, the, so some rum is produced in the Caribbean, but a whole lot of this molasses is shipped. This, this process of produce, taking beer and wine and turning it into whiskey, taking uh, molasses and turning it into rum is much more detailed process. You could use um, a, a boiler to do it, a boiler room to do it in um, the Caribbean, but in fact, you need much more, somebody with much more chemical know-how the people with chemical know-how are the New England colonists. Uh, it's these New Englanders who take this leftover molasses and uh, begin to turn it into rum. So rum is not initially produced in the Caribbean. It's initially produced, or a little bit of it is, but a whole lot of it is produced in New England, basically um, Eastern Maryland, Eastern Connecticut. Uh, sorry, Eastern Connecticut, Eastern uh, Rhode Island, places like that. Okay. So why don't I don't spend a whole lot of time with the Puritans and the Pilgrims? Because they don't matter that much at first. The huge demographic increase in the 17th century in the New World is in the South. And that's enslaved people. That's enslaved Africans being brought over to produce these goods. Right. <laughs> right. They would save up their rations of rum and cause all sorts of uh, problems. So this was this rum. Uh, I had a, something else to say about rum, but let me see what. Uh... Oh, yeah. The way you would test rum for strength, very briefly, is, uh, was uh, you, you'd mix it with a few grains of gunpowder. And if it didn't light, it was too weak. And if it exploded, it was too strong. And if it just barely lit, that was 48% alcohol, then it was just right. So this was how it was that you tested rum uh, to make sure that it was uh, acceptable and, and you know the right proof, basically. This is how people determine the proof of uh, alcohol in this period. 
<laughs> it's dangerous. Okay, so here's my takeaway for um, for for this whole thing: is the transplantation of these goods under war capitalism, the transplantation of these drugs that initially come from the east are transplanted to the west, is done in t very largely. Yeah, would, if they made it wrong, a tiny amount of it you put with gunpowder and it would explode if there was if it was too rich. So if you took Everclear, just FYI, don't, please don't do this. But if you mix Everclear and gunpowder and light it, it would explode. If you take uh, rum and mix it with gunpowder and light it, it'll just burn slightly, uh, like a candle or something like that. Uh, and if it doesn't burn at all, then you're dealing with uh, low proof alcohol. Okay, so here let's look at New England. New England is not really that important in the new world if we look at the overall British North America. And this, this if we think about, um, this is European and African populations combined in the North American colonies, and this includes the Caribbean. This is a world of Africans. This is where, where lots and lots of Africans are transplanted to produce these drugs. The drugs produced in the, the Americas, some old and some new, are concentrated and addictive enough that they get uh, initially a, what's the word, a, a demand among the upper class. But through um, the process of the movement of sailors and soldiers, this becomes a working class uh, desire as well. And so all of these things are increasingly um, consumed more and more by middle by by people in the sort of middle and lower middle classes who any extra amount of money they're going to do they're going to spend it on these drugs. The reason they do this is the addictive qualities of caffeine and nicotine and the other other things that are in, in important. So why is this relevant? This is war capitalism. This is the apotheosis of war capitalism is the sort of transplantation of goods to the new world, of drugs to the new world, the destruction of African communities to, to fill the new world. And this is why the new world is populated and how the new world is populated. The, one could argue that without the massive amounts of money that people are spending on coffee, sugar, tobacco, cocoa, and rum, without the money that people are spending on this, um, the new world would never have been settled. But the value of these goods is so high that it impels others or, or, or it suggests to others a way of uh, bringing people over. Yes, the reason the new world is important is because most of the drug these are drugs and they're pro produced with enslaved Africans. Right, and those drugs are then sent back to Europe. Excellent. Okay, and I have one other picture that I'd like to share with you to have us talk over a little bit, and that is this one. Oops. Oh, no, you can't see it. Okay. Uh, hmm, bear with me here for a second. I'm going to close this and open another one. Okay, I'm gonna move this over. Okay, let's take a look at this image for a second. This I think captures um, what I'm talking about um, when, I, when I talk about the expansion of the, of the new world. So what's, what's going on in this picture? This is, the image is from 1740 or so, and it's called Mr. and Mrs. Roberts. What do you see in this picture? What's going on in this picture? Is that? This is one of the most famous uh, British pictures in the world. Um, What's the what's the image that we get of this of these folks? Who's here? What do you see? What's interesting? There's a gun. Okay. Appear to be a wealthy couple, Mr. and Mrs. Roberts. This is uh, I think it's is that right? Am I right? bear with me here for a second? I don't want to lead you astray here. Uh, Uh, 
Uh, uh, bear with me here for a second. The name of this place. Evo Dutch Sugar Campaigns. Miss, I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, and it's Robert Andrews. Okay, good. So the man seems emotionless. Okay. <laughs> He's, uh, oh, great. It's, it's bright in the front and then darker behind them. Uh, as we go left to the, uh, as we go from right to left, it gets a little bit darker. Uh, yeah, it looks like money on his belt. That's actually all for hunting. That's, that's his, um, what is that? That's that's his shot and and uh, also his gunpowder. <laughs> the dog is interested in the gun. Okay, both of us. It's a beautiful view. Okay, there's two churches. There's one here, and there's one here. Those churches are actually still in existence. Uh, people are very proud. Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. People are very pr proud of this. And British people are very proud of this. British people are terrible at art. And so um, that's the, the um, and in fact, when I was at Yale, I was at Yale for a year and, and uh, there was this museum of British art. And I thought British art, I can see Dutch art. I can see French art, but British art is like, that's like the museum of Brazilian uh, software engineering or something like that. It's like, you don't think of the British. Uh, he has very large eyes. Okay. Yeah, it's a sort of image of gentility, of kind of wealth and repose. Um, yeah, I, I, like I, I thought the Museum of British Art, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be, there's gonna be nothing in it. Um, okay. So, uh, so this image is, uh, Mr. Andrews and there's a lot of discussion. So the, one of the things that, uh, that's, uh, visible about him is this very wealthy person. <laughs> and, uh, so a couple of things. Yeah, that's great. So one thing that people notice, I'm going to zoom in here, is that the painting is unfinished that it's not clear what's in here. It looks like she's writing something, but it's actually un an un apparently an unfinished painting. Some people say it's supposed to be a pheasant. Um, some people suggest that Mr. and Mrs. Andrews were going to have a kid and they were going to have the kid drawn in um, <laughs> when the kid was born. But then, uh, uh, and, and there was a kid born after this picture. <laughs> it's it's hard to say, right? It is a, it's, it's at the center of the picture, but it's basically empty. It's very bizarre. Okay. Um, you would never know it, but Mr. Andrews, okay, so what he's trying to convey here is his wealth, right? And that family's, Andrews' family's wealth. He's married this woman who's provided him uh, this acreage on this estate. He, the suggestion is he's just back from the hunt, right? Because he's got a life of leisure, okay? And on the right here, you see the wheat that uh, he's grown. They call it corn in Britain. Uh, we call it wheat in the United States. And... Um, so he's got his uh, his wheat that has just been harvested. He probably didn't harvest the wheat himself. Uh, you see the sheep in the background. Yeah, <laughs> they both look too clean to run a farm. Okay. Um, th there's a lot of been that's been written about Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Oh, I don't know what corn means. Oh no, they spell. This is how they spelled it. Just like we spell, so the English Corn Laws are actually about wheat. Um, so, so it's a, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a confusing uh, term because when the English people talk about corn, they're actually talking about wheat. Uh, usually, um, corn is basically the little pellets, and so it's it's a it's an ancient Ang Anglo-Saxon word. Um, but um, when when people talk about cornfields in Britain, they're talking actually about what we would call wheat fields. Um, uh, in fact, that's what most Americans ate is corn, the, the maize. And so I think one of the reasons that Americans use the term corn for um, for maize is that it's it's what most people ate in the American colonies. Uh, what most people ate in British, British, British colonies was wheat um, bread. So they call it maize. Yeah, and they feed it, feed it to pigs in the 18th century. They, they, thought, they thought humans could not eat this stuff. Um, so that, so, uh, what we call corn, they would feed to pigs and, and wouldn't eat themselves. Okay. So, um, what he's trying to do is convey this image of gentility. I think that he's a gentleman farmer, that he has very large land holdings. And this actually is, is the land that together now they, they own. Um, the look on her face, a bunch, a bunch of people have remarked on the look on her face and, 
the look on her face is sort of concerned or troubled or maybe maybe not much of, she doesn't much like him there's 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 you know the lips are sort of pursed a little bit she's um her her look is odd in any event the thing that you'd never know about andrews is that andrews makes his money from the slave trade this is not discussed in any of the histories of this picture right he owns six ships that are trading on the atlantic he does look like an infant right and it's that uh, and his his hands uh uh that's interesting he's got old hands and she's got young hands oh he's got gloves okay he's wearing kid gloves made from uh i'm sure those are kid gloves made from um basically a little lamb not a lamb a goat uh no a little lamb those are lambs skin gloves or kid gloves uh <laughs> right um He's a slave trader, but you never know it, right? Nothing about his look is suggests that this is a person who makes his money, in fact, from the importation of drugs from the New World. And in fact, British people don't talk about this at all. The British Museum of uh, His History loves this image, but they don't suggest they don't point out the fact that those um six or seven ships that he owned in the 1750s were bringing slaves from africa to the new world um and this he's at the center of what we would call mercantilism okay uh, and i'll conclude by talking about mercantilism mercantilism is the dream that the mother country is going to get gold and silver and foodstuffs and raw materials from the new world And then in turn, those people in the new world are going to consume British goods. And this is a, this is something that's different about the British is unlike, um, the French or the Spanish or other, or, or others who hoped that French or Spanish exports would, um, feed the new world. This is largely the dream of the British is that you'll see here in this picture. This is from, a, uh, this is sea captains carousing in Suriname in 1750. And these sea captains who are drinking rum, I'm sure, are, um, right, they've got hoes that are, silk hoes that come from Britain. They, they're they wearing shoes that are made, uh, the shoes and the buckles that are produced in Britain. They've got, um, they're wearing linen shirts that come from uh, British linen mills. They're wearing wool coats, silk and wool coats that, um, again, are worth the price of a house. Um, they're smoking tobacco that's being produced locally. <laughs> and then they're, they're, uh, I think, yeah, this somebody's, oh, they're pouring it in his ear. They're pouring alcohol in his ear. Um, I guess this is some sort of form of, uh, humor on the part of, uh, and who are these people? Uh, these people, these sea captains carousing in Suriname, this is 1751. And this is a little later than 1740, these people are all from Rhode Island. These people are all from New England. Because as much as this image was what Britain saw of itself, it saw itself as supporting country estates and a kind of way of life and leisure that depended on slavery in uh, the New World, over time, the people who are gonna sneak in and take over that trade are people like this. The Rhode Island um, merchants, the New England merchants, the New York merchants, who are going to figure it out. <laughs> A wrinkly little toe. <laughs> they do look like thumbs, actually. Now that you think their 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 faces, like like why can't British people draw faces? But anyways, the the, um, the he's the most successful portraitist of the 18th century, and I think he really can't figure out how to draw faces. But uh, that's me. Okay, so to conclude, this is my image of war capitalism: is a kind of uh, a, a system of long term delivery of basically the stealing of commodities that are produced in the east reproducing those commodities transplanting uh transplanting them into greenhouses in universities uh, then transplanting them finally to uh, colonies along the equator and uh, taking captive africans uh, on the coast transporting them to the new world 
uh, this <laughs> this is uh, the um, uh, what, what I would call war capitalism, and and uh, this I think all brings this this destruction of these other communities, uh, particularly in Africa, uh, but also in uh, North America, is brought about by the sort of reconstruction of a new kind of uh, supply chain where the goods are produced in the Americas and delivered all the way back to Britain. This enforcement of this mechanism is gonna be what are called the mercantilist laws, the mercantile laws, uh, the merchant marine, which has, says only English boats, foreign trading monopolies that says only English traders, enumerated commodities like sugar, tobacco, and dye stuff that have to go to British forts first, customs officers in 1673, enforcement in 1675. That's going to enforce this way of life, that make it possible for people like this to own country estates in Britain. The kind of wealth that comes from this is going to come from this international trade in, uh, in goods. Uh, bear with me here. Oh, yes. This triangular trade, right? This triangle is going to get broken in the 1690s. This triangle is going to be replaced um, the triangle is the image, you know, sugar and tobacco and cotton to Europe, textiles, rum, and manufactured goods to Africa, slaves to the Americas. Um, th th this, these, those are the Navigation Acts. The Navigation Acts are generally mercantilist laws. So the Navigation Acts are um, an example of mercantilism, if that makes sense. Okay, so the Navigation Acts are to enforce this triangular trade, to enforce sugar, tobacco, and cotton going to Europe, that, so that guys like Mr. Andrews can have, uh, can be wealthy. That's going to be replaced, that triangular trade is going to be replaced in the 1670s and 1680s by a new triangle in which um, Britain is out of the picture. Rum, and slaves, uh, rum is going to go from New England to the coast of Africa. Slaves are going to go back to New England. Enslaved people, people who are captured, are going to be sent back to New England um, but also to the Caribbean. The Caribbean is going to uh, send molasses and sugar and some enslaved people to New England. Here, this new triangle totally leaves out Mr. Andrews. And Mr. Andrews, as you can imagine, has a tremendous amount of wealth, tremendous amount of power. The war between Mr. Andrews and the New England merchants is going to be the American Revolution. And we'll talk about that uh, after the exam. We'll talk about the attempts to maintain uh, British mercantilism um, in, uh, in the next class on Tuesday. Thanks so much, everybody.